JT Tran of ABCs of Attraction. Um, so honored to have you on the Tony D Show. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for having me. I'm, you know, very pleased to finally be speaking to you and your audience. Yeah, so you have over 10 years of experience in the dating, seduction, pickup industry, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. When I first when I first heard about you was back in the day when I was a newbie, maybe around 2007, and I was watching Mihao's infield <laughs> infield videos, and there was a clip of this this sh 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 little Asian guy, sorry to call you a little Asian guy, and you had this tall, tall babe on the dance floor, and you grabbed her around the waist, and you leaned back and you taught this technique about how you can how a shorter guy can take a taller woman and using leverage with his waist lean back and pull her off the floor and you were spinning this curl around yeah i went out that night and i tried it and i've been teaching i teach pickup too and i've been teaching that for six years to guys that yeah. night and uh, i always give credit to you i'm like i saw this from a guy called asian playboy cool, cool. well thank and, you so much and and thank you for teaching and spreading that knowledge to others it's what i call body language positioning or blp um, the scientific name for that is like proximix, the ability to use like your physical location and body language to your advantage. Because like you said, I'm a short guy, right? Like 90% of the girls I've ever dated are taller than me. So I have to give off a certain kind of physical command presence because yeah. height is very important. You know, it, it is what it is. And and nothing's gonna change that. So I have to use everything to my advantage. So I use a lot of body language and nonverbal communication skills in my tool set. Yeah, well, I'm 5'7", so I can relate. I mean, I'm not that tall. I, I think you're about 5'5", five five, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you, uh, do you primarily teach out of Los Angeles? I know you've traveled a lot, probably over mm -hmm. all over the world. Where are your biggest markets? Um, I mean, obviously, United States, we're located in Los Angeles. Uh, it's where, you know, ABC's of Attraction headquarters is. And, you know, we hit the major cities, San Francisco, New York. Um, and then we've got like more the tier two cities like Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. Dallas, you know, occasionally we'll go up to Canada. Um, but what we find is most people will, will come down. Um, from Canada, like they'll go to New York or, you know, if they're in Vancouver, they'll go to like Seattle or something like that. And I do Australia, I love Australia. And I'm actually going to London in February. That'll be a lot of fun. I love like the English and European girls so much. Yeah, like, I was just there actually. Yeah. In London. It's yeah. a really, really interesting place. It's really great for day game. That's what I was doing because you have like oh, uh, yeah. the Leicester Square. There's, there's people yep. everywhere, yep. all kinds of people. You see a lot more Caucasian, Caucasians there and Europeans there, mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of people from all over the world, and it's really great for day game, I found. Well, I, I, I think my preference for England has to do with the fact that, one, they're more classy, they classy in a sexy way. Here in Los Angeles, it's about showing as much skin and cleavage and boobs as possible, which is nothing yeah. wrong with that. I love that, just like any other guy. But, you know, when I go to London, I'm like, okay, these girls are like a, a tier above. They're sexy but classy. Like, you know, I'm a, a fan of like Kate Middleton, that kind of look, that kind of sexy elegance. And two, um, it's a sad fact of American life that like half, I think, of Americans don't even have passports, right? They've never traveled. They don't speak a second language. You go to Europe, you go to England, and you meet these European girls who are well traveled, who speak multiple languages, and you know they're generally more open minded because they're more cosmopolitan and have a more kind of sophisticated outlook on life. I totally agree, and I find the European girls to be a bit more educated, a little bit more interesting to talk to, and they they dress better. Yeah. It's true. They have amazing fashion sense in London. Yeah. So. So you've been you've been involved in this scene for over ten years. Just how did you get into becoming a, a dating specialist for men? What's well, your story? Well, you know, probably very similar to a lot of guys. Um, I completely sucked with women. I know some guys don't believe that um, when they see me on the field, but the reality is, I am an introvert by nature. You have to realize I'm a rocket scientist by training. Like literally, I work for NASA and the Air Force as an aerospace engineer. And I wanted to be an astronaut when I was growing up, right? So completely nerdy. And I didn't date until college. Like I went to prom by myself at high school. I, I, 
Canada, does Canada have like prom? It's like their yeah. senior year dance. You know, you're supposed to go and maybe lose your virginity or something like that. But I didn't kiss my first girl until the age of 20. And she chose me. And I was incredibly lucky because she was this five foot nine blonde, blue eyed, very pretty. And it was an engineering school. So they're like ten guys for every one girl. So I was like one of the few guys that had a girlfriend, first of all. And secondly, I was the only Asian guy with like a white blonde girlfriend. So I was incredibly lucky. And in retrospect, you know, I asked her why she was attracted to me. And she said a couple of things that looking back, knowing what I know now, were like kind of psychological um, pickup principles. So she said that I, I lit up the room when I came in. And I, you know, I come in, I saw all my friends. I'm like, what's up? What's up? What's up? And then I see her and I like, I don't know you. And I walk away. But the thing is like in her mind, she's like, okay, that was weird. Like, why didn't, why wasn't he nice to me? Right. I'm like the pretty girl in the room. And so she, that made me different in her eyes. Right. But in my mind, I was like, oh shit, pretty girl. Can't talk to her. Can't talk to her. Right. Yeah. That's why I like ran away. I, I wasn't cool or anything like that. I was just scared. Um, and so like, you know, she said that I had a certain kind of this charisma, um, this ability to, to smile and, and just make people feel good around me. And because, you know, at the time I'm exploring college and I'm just like, I got these friends, life is sort of amazing. Um, and I was able to exude that completely by accident, though. And then I moved out to California to pursue my engineering, you know, career, and I sucked. I sucked very badly. I tried speed dating, failed at that. No one chose me, even like the, you know, the hunchback girl, with the mole and the, you know, the, the hair sticking out of her mole. I tried online dating, you know, this is back in the day when eHarmony has you fill out a, you know, survey personality test. And I get the yeah. results back and it says, JT, you are too cerebral and too analytical and too intellectual to, and we can't find a match for you. So we're going to reject your application. You are too intelligent. <laughs> exactly. So all this is hitting me, right? I'm like, is it because I'm Asian? Is it because I'm short? Is it because I'm not muscular? Is it because I'm not handsome? You know, what's going on? Why am I not able to get dates? And that's when and I... You read Pardon me? And then you read the game? Well, I was actually, I read an article by Neil Strauss in LA Times. And then I went up to Mystery. And when I was learning game was when Neil Strauss was writing about the game. <laughs> yeah. I was like there for like 70% of the book, essentially. Um, Did I, like, you live in I crashed there. I partied there. I slept over there. Like Katia, you know, Mystery's ex-girlfriend was like a friend of mine. Um, so... I was like, you know, on the periphery watching all the craziness happen. Like, I wasn't good enough to be a teacher at that time because this was back in 2004 and I was just learning. But I was going out like going out four to six nights a week while holding down a nine to five engineering job. Like that, that's how dedicated I was to getting better. Um, yeah. And then I started the agent. Sorry, sorry it's, can you turn down maybe because I'm getting all that was maybe turn back the Turn down the volume on your computer. Okay, let me see. Check, 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 check. Can I still hear myself? There we go. There we go. Is that working a little bit better? Yeah, well, a lot better. Okay. Yeah, okay, so you were um, going out four to six nights a week. You were putting in your dues, which is what I think holds most guys back from actually ever getting good. Is that they just don't practice enough. Every yeah. guy I know that became pro, they practice their ass off. And you were doing this at a time when it was so brand new. Were you doing routines? Were you really doing? I was trying it all. I was trying it all. Yeah. Like you know, mystery was sort of the originator of applied psychology in pickup, and so I was using his openers. I tried peacocking. I tried all different types of stuff, and it was a revelation to me to realize that you could actually control this. That you had some some say in the manner of approaching girls and getting a. A consistent response because you know probably like most guys I thought it was just luck you either had it or you didn't right and here it was you know seeing mystery in action I'm like wow he can do this and you know it's not gonna be 100% obviously but 
you know, it's going to be consistently over 50%, you know, getting girls to open, getting girls to respond, getting their numbers. And I'm like, this is really cool. And it appealed to my scientific and analytical kind of left brain nature. And like, there is an actual science and art to this, right? Yes. Um, and then I started the Asian Playboy blog. Uh, that's where I get kind of get my stage name because I was looking for some, you know, something that described who I was. I'm like, okay, I'm living the Playboy lifestyle, and being Asian is important to my identity. So Asian Playboy, and then you know, just one thing started leading another. I got a pretty big following, and then this Chinese Canadian mother from Toronto actually called me up. She had been reading my blog, and she wanted me to help out her son who had been harassed by neo Nazis. And I was like, you know, for three days and three nights, ma'am, I'm going to be the big brother he never had. So she flew me up and, you know, paid for my flight, hotel, had a car pick me up. And she's like, and I'll pay you. I'm like, holy shit, I can, there's a career out of this? Because I never thought of that, right? The blog was just like sex in the city, but for Asian men. Like, I was like the, the Asian version of Carrie Bradshaw. Just writing my dating stories, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, when I had success, but also when I had like embarrassing like failures. And it just appealed because no one else was really doing that at the time of like 2005. Again, this is when, you know, pickup was very new. Yeah, it was new. Definitely back then it was a little baby and now it's bloomed into this massive industry and you have one of probably the, the most... I would say the most visible companies other than maybe RSD or uh, Love Systems. I think oh, ABCs okay. is quite a – in the mainstream, I've seen you quite a bit. on Yeah, yeah. And stuff, yeah. So. I think what? it – sorry, I, I was going to say, I think it helps that with my company and my mission statement is informed by my first client, the Chinese-Canadian mother and her high school son, and the fact that, yes, what I do is about – helping guys get laid, but there is a higher calling, you know, there is that, you know, helping my Asian brothers deal with stereotypes and racism and trying to present a positive role model because, you know, I'm sure you've had Asian clients and there's this deep, yeah, there's this deep frustration, the fact that the media represents us in a negative manner and that we didn't have like positive uh, role models growing up other than Bruce Lee. And Hey, I love Bruce Lee, right? But the man's been dead for 30 years. <laughs> you know? We don't really have a lot of role models. And that's... You have Harold you know, Kumar now. Yeah. Uh, they're representing... And, uh, Slowly, the, yeah. Sulu, the new Sulu in Star Trek. There's that. Jeremy Lin, uh, the basketball yeah. player. We've got a couple of shows. So it's slowly changing. It's not going to help the, the average Asian man right now. Maybe our grandkids. But it, it is slowly changing. So let's get into your specialty. Because I have a sure. lot of Asian... Uh, listeners and readers of my blog and because I'm in Vancouver BC and mm-hmm. I don't know how how racist this sounds but there's a nickname that's called Honkouver yeah heard I've this. heard that but it's like you if you go on to any any street you see the vast majority 50% are probably Asians I'm not just saying Chinese but Vietnamese and Malaysians and all kinds of so I have a lot of Asian friends and a lot of my clients are Asians and some of them they don't bring up with me when I'm working with them, any issues about their race, but some guys are really stuck on, on um, feeling like limited by their their race, and and from probably I don't know where they're all coming from, but I do know a little bit about, I guess you could call it Bob Asian culture, and that there is a tendency to be taught to be seen, not heard, mm-hmm. to um, not be social, especially with all the Asian girls I've talked to, Asian women here in Vancouver, a lot of them are really taken aback when they get approached. It's almost frightening for them, and yeah. And you have to approach them a bit differently. And with men, I find Asian men to be generally very timid in the beginning. The guys that get good at game, though, they're as good as anybody. They, they're fantastic and they're very inspiring just because of where they came from. What would you say are the biggest limiting beliefs, or if, if they're not even limiting beliefs, obstacles for Asian men to get over to have success dating maybe Caucasian girls, which is what a lot of them seem to want to do? Right, right. Well, the first mistake or obstacle is like you're saying the belief that because you're asian you're not going to be successful with like a white girl or a black girl or a latin girl and you know what i'll be honest i i used to think that too you know you watch hollywood enough and it kind of demeans asian masculinity and i start to believe that and it becomes a self sort of self-fulfilling prophecy and the thing is what in my experience is 
Well, let me ask you this question. You know, what do you yeah. think is the number one stereotype that women, okay, non-Asian women have of Asian men? What do you think is the number one stereotype? Well, small penises probably, or I, uh, being good at math, or some you know the typical yeah stereotypes. Yeah. But here's the thing, in, in um, like the thousands of women I've approached and like the thousands of women my students have approached, what I hear is Asian guys only date Asian girls. Oh. That's the number one stereotype. I've like kind of done my own little survey over these past 10 years. Like the small penis one definitely comes up, but that's actually a stereotype that guys bring up to other guys. You're absolutely right. I was just, I was just questioning that because it's not a question I'm ever asked. Uh, I, I don't go up to I, I'm not Asian so I don't go to the women and ask them questions about my ethnicity because I'm just mm-hmm. a Caucasian dude right so that's interesting because that small penis thing just comes from the media or from a joke somewhere right right, right? and it's mostly guys that bring it up it's really not girls yeah. that bring it up um, and so what what's happening is like say this white girl Canadian white girl or you know or whatever non-Asian girl that you know and she thinks okay I find Asian men attractive but he's only ever going to marry an Asian girl or he's only going to date an Asian girl or maybe he'll sleep with me, but there's no long-term relationship potential there. So right. why bother? And the Asian guy's like thinking, oh, she's not even looking at me. She's stuck up. She doesn't like Asian guys, so I'm not going to bother to approach her. So it's just like this vortex of misunderstanding and it's just reinforcing this, this devastating cycle. But the thing is, it's up to Asian guys to break that cycle. Like we have to go up there right. and... Does racism happen in the field? Sure, but it's it's rare. It happens, but you know, what I tell my students is if you walk like a stereotype, you look like a stereotype, and you talk like a stereotype, you will be treated as a stereotype. So this is why I teach my Asian students predominantly like direct game. I mean, I, I teach the mix, indirect and direct and situational, but every Asian guy has to learn direct game. It's not an option. He must learn direct game. Because it forces the girl to look at you, look at me differently. I'm not like another kind of platonic Asian guy. I am someone romantic, sexual, dominant, assertive. And again, this is true of anybody who's not classically good looking. You don't have to simply be Asian. Like I'm five foot five. I'm short. But the thing is like most of the girls I date are taller than me. So I have yeah. to differentiate myself. I can't be another little short guy because she's not going to think of dating me or sleeping with me. Yeah. Right. So, you know, and that way um, is you got to go, you have to differentiate yourself. And typically that is with a lot more direct, dominant sexuality, you know. Yeah, I found it in a lot of infield videos with with Asian guys, like the simple, the simple pickup guys yourself. And, and some, there's a lot of Asian guys making infield videos these days. A lot of them use and I, I teach my clients to use their limiting beliefs to their advantage in their verbal game so they'll use their asianness and make jokes about themselves and and make make self-referential humor about their culture and i find that this if, if they make fun of the things that aren't being said about themselves it seems to be charming is that something you teach or well you i, I believe i mean i believe in you know being successful because you're an asian man and not in spite of it I think it's okay to sort of have a mutual laugh at the vagaries of, of different cultural like juxtapositions, but I wouldn't be like self-deprecating on your own culture because that sort of talks a little bit about the insecurity. Like, you know, putting each other down when you're with your friends and you put each other down, that's fine, right? You know, you're with your bros, but when you're like doing it to a girl that you barely know, um, Sometimes that humor can be taken as as a bit of um, lack of self esteem, so to speak, or like you're insecure in your own cultural identity. Um, and then the, you know, quick warning about like infield pickup videos. Yet the there are different classes and types of infield. Like simple pickup definitely pioneered infield videos, but theirs is about humor and entertainment. You know, it's not real like actual strategy it, it's, it's there to entertain and drive advertising dollars it is it is absolutely i think you're um it's hand-picked to be very entertaining mm-hmm. and to get shares and it's not so educational but it is inspiring it's sure. something i i show to asian guys who have a lot of limiting beliefs and i say look at these three guys they're killing it uh, so going direct let's go back to that what, what sort of i guess technique or i hate to say line 
but when you, where are you putting guys into these situations where they can practice this? Is this happening in clubs and bars or uh, more right, in daytime? Right. Well, during our boot camp, we do like two nights and one day. Uh, so that way we mix it up so everybody has sort of a, a pretty good skill set and experience in any kind of an environment. And at nighttime, we do a lot of nights simply because it's a very easy place to practice without any kind of, you know, consequences, right? You're at a bar, you're at a club, you make mistakes. And, you know, let's be honest, a lot of Asian guys don't have a high level, not every Asian guy, but you know, a good number of Asian guys don't have a high level of social experience. So they're gonna make a lot of mistakes. And at nighttime, no one cares. So at nighttime, I'll, what I'll do is, you know, I'll teach some indirect style first and then we'll graduate to direct style. But in direct style, what I'll teach is, I want them to keynote even before they open their mouth. Even before they say hi, Kino first. You wouldn't do, do it so much during the day, right? But at nighttime, yeah. there's this sort of social understanding that people are socializing, people are very crowded together, so it's kind of normal. And so if you're touching in the appropriate way, not the, the creepy way, um, then it's fine. And what I teach is like the Kino term where you touch on the shoulder and turn her. But again, you're not trying to cop a feel or be creepy or anything like that. You're just trying to get her attention, right? Yeah. And you wouldn't use any more force than you would with like your pinky, right? It's like opening your door, just getting her attention, letting go, not trying to cop a feel. And then you you go direct. But and this is probably something that you unconsciously realize, Tony, with your Asian clients. It's something called the Asian poker face. Right? Yes. This sort of like lack of com complete lack of facial expressions, right? So I teach a lot of body language, and a lot of facial expressions, the how to emote. Because the first thing she sees is your face, right? Yeah. And if the, he Why has a, that, a, what? Why is it the Asian men have this issue, do you think? Well, I think it's just part of culture, you know, just not as expressive. Um, and also just, you know, like the Western society has sort of um, made fun of Asians who are more expressive. Um, I mean, going back to the topic at hand is this is the first thing that she sees. So if you have your Asian poker face and it's like, like that, she's not going to want to talk to you. Right. You got to smile, make good solid eye contact. And then I go my direct opening, which is what I call my favorite. I teach a couple different ones, but my favorite is my direct kamikaze line, which is you are fucking adorable. Right. Or you are yeah. fucking beautiful. And there's a study that says that when you cuss, you know, you're considered more authentic and honest and genuine, right? That's really interesting. Yeah. And the thing is, like, I have That's a really lot of fobby students who barely speak English. So <laughs> you're not going to teach them, like, really complicated lines, right? Yeah. You just – four words. It's easy to, to master four words. You are fucking beautiful. And it works. It really works. It, it gets a, a, a bit – more of a hook into them with the fuck because it's something that's polarizing. Absolutely, um, absolutely. And the thing is, like, a lot of it is dependent on nonverbal communication skills because I'll spend yeah. like half over half of the boot camp teaching that because that's more important, to be honest with you. But also, you, find you know, if you can imagine um, a fobby Asian guy, I can't do an Asian accent, but if you could imagine a fobby Asian accent, he, and he says, You are fucking beautiful. It just, that was pretty good. it's so good though. When, when my Fabi Asian students do that, it's just mind blowing to girls because it is a complete yeah. juxtaposition. It's a complete dichotomy. Like it's that very dominant, you're saying fucking and she's beautiful, but you have this kind of yeah. accent. It just, they can't box you. <laughs> There's no like yeah. easy box to put this guy in. So it forces her to be like, okay, this guy's different. He's unique. You know? Yeah. Well, when guys come to me with like a really like thick accent, a thick accent, and they're, a lot of guys are insecure about that accent, I tell them to actually play up the accent and use it to their advantage. Like if I have an Indian guy, I'm mm -hmm. like, just be more Indian. But it's, you know, just to show that they're really confident with that. At the same time, they should be studying to reduce it. Do you find that accents hurt guys or help them? Well, I mean, there are definitely like accent reduction classes, and it definitely helps. Um, it's obviously something that's not going to change overnight, just like working out and, you know, putting on muscle mass, you, 
you want them to 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 go from like skinny to actually like maybe average size, but it it'll take time. But you know, yeah. in the, the current like that situation in the here and now, like you were saying a little bit before, acknowledge acknowledge it. He can go up to a girl and say, "Hey, excuse me, pardon me. You know, I'm I'm not from this country, uh, and you know, could you help me out or whatever the opener is?" Sort of calling the issue out beforehand and thus disarming it because yeah. again we're socially conditioned to be nice to people who are being nice right especially in immigrants um especially like asian immigrants because we tend to have a pretty good kind of positive stereotype in in that regards at least so you know people aren't going to really be rude some will obviously but it's like you know a, a a person isn't going to kick a puppy dog, right? So if the yeah. person is coming in and he's just being really nice with his thick accent... Unless the puppy dog is kicking at me wrong, then I'm not going to fuck around. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, just I would just say call it out. You know, just acknowledge it, like just like you said before. So, um, have you taught in Asia? Have you been to Hong Kong or, or China? Or well, my Asia? other... My Chinese instructors have, like Taiwan, oh. Thailand, China. I've taught in Japan. So that was pretty mm -hmm. cool. What was it like teaching in Japan? Uh, were you there? Were you there? No, I went to Southeast Asia. Oh, Southeast Asia. I, I, have, I have stories about using my white privilege. To <laughs> hey, man, you know, if you got it, use it. It's like whatever to me. Uh, but Japan was really fascinating. I would say Japan, Tokyo has like the hardest day game in the world. And I really? say this teaching like everywhere. Um, I've only never taught in like Africa and Antarctica. I've like taught everywhere from South America to Australia, but Tokyo hardest because Japanese women would literally start running away from you. If you said hi to them. That's what happens here with a lot of the Bob girls. They, they, go, <laughs> they giggle and they go like this and they run. I have to pre-talk my clients. I say, do you like Asian girls? Uh, a lot of my Asian clients, they only want to talk to Asian girls mm. sometimes and white guys or whatever. They love Asian women. I say, okay, we'll be prepared to understand that if they run away, it's nothing personal. Mm. We'll work on your approach a little bit. So that happened a lot. It's a, it's a cultural phenomenon there, is it? Yeah, it, it was, it was kind of tough. I mean, we eventually got like, you know, results for them. Um, but it was definitely like, just like, I've never seen like women just start running. And <laughs> my students are like well-dressed business suits. They weren't looking like thugs. They just start running. I'm like, okay. Um, right. And uh, no, Japan was interesting. It's very odd, but I really liked. I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. But it was definitely odd. Like there's like that no dancing but, law. Like you can't. It's literally illegal to dance in a club. Like what? There, yes, there's like literally signs that say like it is illegal to dance. Why? You know what? What was it? I, I read an article. Something about back in the day. It, it you know. It, it, it made it a club or something like that, and there would be a lot of drugs, so they banned dancing or something yeah. like that. I mean, there's an entire history around it, so. It's a Yakuza thing. Like, there's, don't dance, that means you're, you're Yakuza. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so it was definitely an odd experience. It's funny because um, Asian Asian women tend to, to like club women tend to come off as more submissive, and that's actually a trait that a lot of men like in, mm -hmm. in dating Asian women is that they they seem more submissive and maybe that submissiveness submit that submissiveness manifests in a, as a sort of fear in a way that you know they're going to do something wrong or be judged by their society but I know um it, the Japanese women are so beautiful anyway do you have any like um thoughts after coming out of Japan on what you would do differently next time ah <laughs> uh... I just mostly start like white girls, to be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I mean, my instructors, they like Asian sure. girls. I mean, but I mean, I know I've dated Asian girls, but it's not really my preference. Where's the best country you've been where you had the most success? For the Asian guys that want to know about using their... Uh, oh, you know, most possible. success? London, uh, Sydney, Vegas. Uh, New York is good. Um, but I mean, my personal preference is London. I really like it a, a lot. Again, like I said, they're classy, they're sexy, they're beautiful. Um, but I would say it's like Sydney is probably the easiest place I've ever been to to approach. Like ridiculously easy. Like 
one time I was demoing for a student and I did what like that entire night like 12 demonstrations or something like that and nine of them hooked like we're talking like 80 90 percent like hit rate that's pretty freaking good <laughs> it's just like they just, they just opened up too. hmm You've been doing this 10 years, right? So, yeah. I mean, uh, and Australia is a very, I hate to say feminist. I don't want to go into the red pill talk, but it's mm. a very feminist friendly country. And, and feminism is notoriously pro promiscuity and sex in a way. Uh, so you would have a very open culture that way. And plus they're all bred from rapists and criminals, aren't yeah. they? Generations <laughs> of it. So they have that bad girl thing going on. Maybe that's, that's interesting. Do you do mostly, are you more for your own personal, enjoyment are you still going out to clubs on your own or is it something you just do for work or do you still go out and do day game is pickup still a big part of your life or just something you do for work now and you have other hobbies that you're interested in after 10 years in well i mean i, I do my own thing but i still enjoy going out that's sort of like ingrained into my bones now um i mean i don't really do day game you know like i said i'm a, um, I'm a nighttime specialist again Back in 2004, Mystery, like Project Hollywood, it was like night game, night game, night game, night game. And I would have to say, I sort of need that excitement from night game. Because otherwise, day game to me is just like really boring. I, and so, I, like I said, I you know practice it, but it's not like my favorite. It's not what I enjoy. Like I have like day game specialists on my staff. But like for me, yeah, like I, I, I'm so used to the Hollywood nightlife. I need like the craziness and the strippers and the strip poles to yeah. really <laughs> get my motor running. So what's your what's the scene like down in LA these days? It seems like like three quarters of the world's dating coaches and pickup artists come out of LA. When you go to a club, are you spotting like uh, you know these guys in this corner and a ten student boot camp in that <laughs> corner? Or are you doing your own thing? Well, I mean, I, I do get recognized a lot. Um, there's a lot of PUAs, without a doubt. I mean. Los Angeles is like the, the pickup capital of the world, so to speak. Yeah. Um, so this is why I sort of gravitate towards those venues that are very difficult to get into. Um, yeah. One, the girls are going to be hotter. And, and two, there aren't going to be other P ways. Because most P ways are lazy, right? They don't want to yeah. try to get into places that are really difficult to get into. Um, but yeah, yeah. Like most, most guys go to LA, you know, for, for pickup. Um, although I would say Canada has a lot of pickup artists for, you know, you, you, a lot of like the that's originals came all, from. That's where all the big, some of the biggest guys came from was yeah. Toronto mystery and Tyler Durden and these guys. Yeah. There's a lot of that going on. A lot of PUAs here in Vancouver. Is it because like the, so, the, the, the weather makes men lonely up there? <laughs> What's going on? It's horny up here. It's a hard life, you know, the yeah. tundra. We have more testosterone, maybe. I've been to L.A., and I went clubbing. I just stayed in the hostel, and I went around the strip, and I went on one of these. I was with a student. I didn't know shit about L.A., and I went to these booths where they sell these Groupon tickets to go to different bars, and we would go with this group, and we would be the only ones there. But I met girls that, like, partied with fucking uh, Mike Tyson mm -hmm. and, like, and just the girls I'm meeting around telling me stories about partying with celebrities and stuff. I mean... You, you see a lot of these movie stars and rock stars at the clubs when you're sarging and stuff. That must be interesting. Do you learn anything seeing those guys? Sure, in sure. Um, this is Hollywood, and you're going to run into celebrities left and right. But it is fascinating. Like, I've one of my students is, like, uh, close friends with a couple of celebrities. And I remember I'm sarging with, like, Wesley Snipes, right? Oh, yeah. um, and it was just really fascinating to see girls running game on him. They're like running their, their, their style of group theory um, and trying to merge sets. Or when I saw like Quentin Tarantino, like it was really fascinating. It was like a restaurant and Quentin there was like a, a buddy and it's like some sort of double date. I don't know if he's married, whatever. So it was like four, you know, two guys, two girls. And this girl, he's walking into the restaurant and this girl with her friends is walking out. She's like, oh my God, it's Quentin Tarantino. Wow. It's, you know, she's, she approaches, she's assertive and like, Quentin's date, okay, is trying to is gonna a fog, right? Alpha female of the group, yeah. and she goes, "Oh, you know, it's cool, you know. It, it was a pleasure meeting you, right? Like a dismissal, and like a, a weak beta girl would have like walked away, <laughs> but no, this girl's like, yeah, yeah, it was a total pleasure meeting you here. Let me introduce you to my friends, 
And she emerges her girlfriend and guy from the back to talk to them. And she's like trying to mini isolate Quentin. I was just watching this. It's like, these girls know game. They know game. She's like, she's like, we're too similar. We'd never get along. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing is, is girls, they do know game. It is, it's not obviously as codified and scientific as the way we teach pickup. But, you know, you got a pretty girl who's been socialized for however many thousands of guys have approached her. She knows what's going on. You know, maybe not in the way that we define it, but she knows what's going on. Isn't there a funny double standard where girls can read dating books and it's all fine? And if we, if we go out and we con and people find out we're consciously trying to pick up, it's kind of weird. I'm hoping in the future this changes where it's, we're not, it's not such a stigma to study seduction and practice it as a hobby. But I don't know if that day will ever come because it seems like in a woman's mind it's supposed to just naturally happen. Yeah. This is your career. Do you, do you ever feel like you are sort of an outlaw or do you feel like you've become like the mainstream acceptable dating coach where people just see you as like a hitch or what? what's it like? Right, right. Well, there's definitely a stigma associated with like learning how to date, especially for men, you know, obviously less so for women. Um, I've been lucky enough and fortunate enough that because of my company – because we're, you know, on top of like getting with women, we have that social issue at play of, of, of trying to be positive role models and dealing with racism that I tend to have a little bit more mainstream media accept acceptance, you know, for all the yeah. positive media that I've done. But it is difficult. There is definitely a stigma attached to it. Um, and whether it would change in the future, maybe. But then, you know, I know some, some guys are like, oh, they... Like you're talking about the red pill and feminists. I just remind them, you know what? The reason why pickup exists is because of feminism. Like we are in this job and career because of feminism. It's actually a good thing because this is not back in the day where your parents set you up or you had an arranged marriage, right? Yeah. Because if we were still dating in, in that, then there would be no need for pickup, right? And yeah. it's because dating has changed and it's very volatile and very malleable and it's, it's changing now technology has changed it a lot recently too that yep. there will be a call you know and so we're in a job both of us are in a job because of the of, of the way dating has changed and because of feminists so quite frankly my reframe is like i thank feminists for giving me a job yeah well i mean i never i've, I've thought about that in a way but on another subject, I'm here because of guys like you who help to create this industry and create the demand because especially you guys have broken through into the mainstream more. And I actually avoid the mainstream a lot. Uh, when I get interviews from them, sometimes I shy away from them because they try to put you in this box. But you guys being brave enough to go out there and give us a good image uh, to counteract the bad one that pick up artists have gotten with guys like, you know, we won't name names right yeah. now, but you know who – other guys the dark I side really, of pickup yeah the dark side right which um anyway i appreciate all of you old school guys who are still doing it and killing it so that new guys like myself and people i know can come up in the next generation and and make it harder for everyone to make money but uh <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> I, I don't believe in competition in the industry like one of the reasons i'm doing these interviews is because i i um i don't care about losing business i want to tell everybody this is jt tran he's a great coach i've read his shit and he's awesome um who do you work with outside of your own company do you ever do collaborations with any of the other guys well just like you i've done like tons of interviews with uh, some of our industry peers and i'm friends with a lot of them from kezia noble Haley quinn adam lines me how um i'm not afraid to collaborate like you know, I, I, I definitely gravitate towards those who I think are on top of a game and honest and, you know, ethical. Um, so I've done, like, a, you know, collabed with, with others. Um, you know, I've got my own YouTube channel. So, you know, it's got all the different kind of gurus that I've interviewed, as well as just people outside of the industry. You know, I've like yeah. a fashion stylist, a matchmaker, etiquette coach. Um, yeah. It's about, like you're, you're really saying, like self-education. I respect your hustle. That's one of the things I like about you. Like when I talk to coaches, we rarely, very rarely talk about pickup, which is like an interesting <laughs> subject. But most of us talk about business and marketing 
and uh, networking and all this kind of cool stuff. And I've, I've looked into you and I've noticed one thing about you is your hustle is on point. You got like an up to date YouTube channel. You're still blogging. You're still doing in field coaching. And that's really great. No, thank you. Um, thank you. Dark side. So what would you consider dark side? Uh, dark side is like pick up um, results at any cost. At any cost to both like the girl as well as the guy. Um, because there are ways to manipulate a guy to get in results like immediately. And there is something to be said for that because results help build your, your referential experience. All right now everyone has their pens out waiting for this. <laughs> but at the same time, it can lay down a groundwork of either poor habits or a poor kind of mental framework. It's this idea of just... I am going to get laid regardless if that costs me in the long term and regardless of that that hurts another person. Like as a coach for me, I look at what is the long term benefit? What is the bigger benefit for my student? So yes, yeah, sometimes they have to be like this guy just needs a one night stand. He just needs to get laid. Like he doesn't need to get married right now. He just he needs to just get laid so he can have sex and start to have that referential experience of just being sexual. Yeah. Um but at the same time, like if that's all they're concentrated on, you as a man, I'm sure you, you know this being, being through yourself, you grow when you're in like a relationship where you live with a person and you have to understand how to compromise. Like with a lot of Asian guys, you know, there's something called like the little emperor syndrome where because of China's one child policy, a lot of these Asian guys are singles. You know, they're, they're like the only child. And so they're coddled. You know, their mother and their father, you know, their entire life has taken care of everything for them. So I'll have students that literally do not know how to cook, do not know how to do laundry, and do not keep up, like, the house, like, clean or anything like that. Because they're used to someone else doing it, like their mom doing it. So, you know, as a man, you've got to grow. And part of it is sex, sure, but also part of it is being in a relationship. So I look at the students, like, what is to his benefit? Some of it is like, yep. yeah, he just needs to get laid. But others like, what, you know, does getting laid now, will that hurt him over the long term? And I think the dark side is like, get laid now, no matter the cost. Yeah, just very aggressive club game. I call it rub your dick on her game. So <laughs> I tell some guys, this is not something, I wrote this on my blog once and I actually got attacked by um, haters pretty hard for it. But I said, if, if you really just want to get laid and you don't give a shit, you got some confidence and social skill, just go on the dance floor and just start grinding on girls and trying to pull them out of the club. I said, you'll get in trouble if you do this eventually. But um, but I think what you're saying is you should look more at the holistic, big picture. Yeah. Uh, developing social skills as well as your ability to, ability to sexual escalate. Yeah. I mean, again, it's everything, every advice that I give and that you give, you have to understand the context. The context of the device and the context of the student. Because some of the advice that I give isn't really applicable to like a beginner. Some of the advice that I give isn't really applicable to the expert. And you have to understand, like, is this, you know, by him doing this particular thing, does it cost him an opportunity later down the line? Because some people will say, okay, um, you know, go out, be crazy, do, like, socially weird stuff to get yourself outside of your comfort zone. And again, yeah. that's not a bad thing, but if that's all they do, they become calibrated from being like unsure of themselves to being delusional, right? right. You know, you see this, guys who, who watch certain types of infield pickup, they see like these guys doing crazy stuff and they think, oh, I'll do that because that's normal behavior. I don't know about yeah. you, but I got into this to be cool and get girls. I didn't get into this yeah. to be the weirdo that get girls, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, would you say most of what you're teaching in, in the nightclub is f focused on verbals or physical? Oh, physical, absolutely. Again, realize that with a lot of my clients, they don't have good verbal game. Even like the Asian Americans um, who speak perfect English m will typically be like average in their verbal game at best. And then you have the fobs. There's no point in me trying to emphasize it. I mean, I'll teach it. And I have a lot yeah. of useful skills and, you know, there's a seminar I do, The Art of Creative Conversation, where there are like these, a lot of verbal skill sets that go increasingly difficult um, practice 
uh, and, and technique, but with my students, that's overkill because a lot of them don't have the greatest verbal skill sets. So the universal language your... that everyone understands is body language. Yeah, what's one of your staples? So because we're gonna, you know, wrap this up pretty quickly for a guy. Say he's not like a hard case. He can approach girls, but he's not really good at physically escalating. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would be one or two of the staples you would give to every client to get them uh, more physical with the women in the club? Well, I think the reason why guys are afraid to sexually escalate is they don't know how she's going to respond. It's like, oh, she's going to slap me, or oh, she's going to throw a drink in my face, right? So what I do is what I call a sex compliance test, all right, where she's going to basically give me signals is as to whether or not I can rapidly sexually escalate. So it's kind of hard to, to see just doing this over Skype, but let's say I shake her hand or some something that I do where we, we, we meet hands. And if you can imagine, like I'm shaking hands and I'll turn my hand under, right? Mm -hmm. And I will see, like imagine we're shaking hands and I turn my hand like, like this, right? Yeah. And her hand is on top. I'm going to see how long she keeps holding my hand. It's very subtle. And I'm talking all at the same time. I'm just gaming and I'm talking. And if she keeps her, she keeps, if she moves her hand right away, I know I can't really sexually escalate. But if she keeps it there, signs are good, right? She's not afraid of my touch. And then as I'm gaming, I might squeeze, I might tickle, I might like rub a thumb, right? So all these things, like, she's making a choice to hold my hand. I'm not forcing her. There's a time and place to be like physically dominant and caveman and to sexually escalate. But at this point, yeah. I wanted to see if she is willing and enjoying my touch. So if she's doing yeah. that, I might do a couple other things where, again, this is kind of difficult if you can just sort of imagine. Like it, I call it the archangel, okay? Do a double high five. So you do a double high five and then you roll down like this, like the, the, the arch of an angel's wings. And then I will yep. put my hands again underneath, right? And she'll start holding my hands. Maybe I'll intertwine my fingers. And what I'm doing is, is she willing to hold both my hands? Is she willing to like intertwine her fingers with mine? Okay. Right. And all these things are saying when she's willing to do all of that, again, she's giving me signals that she's okay for me to escalate. Or maybe if I'm sitting down next to her, what I'll do is like, I might like high five on the side right here. I don't do it like here because then it's going to be her other hand, right? I want to do a high five here because then it's her closest hand that has to high five me. And I'll take her hand and I'll roll it down to my knee and I'll let go. I want to see how long she keeps her hand on my knee. And then like if she takes it away really fast, it's like, okay, I got to game more. She keeps it there, sends it good. And then like if she keeps it there for like whatever, five, ten minutes, I'll push it up. Game, game, game. And I'll just push it up. Like the like that's her choice. She's choosing to touch me. Right? Yeah. So that way I know. So that way when I sexually escalate nine times out of ten, it'll be completely rejection free because I'm testing before I make a move. It's all her choice what where, where how how far she wants to go with that physical. Yeah, yeah. I'm leading her there. I'm leading her like, you know, the horse to water, so to speak, and seeing if she drinks, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about polling before you go because this is something that a lot of guys struggle with. They got the girl, she's physical, maybe they're even hugging, they've done the physical compliance tests, the girl's into her, and they want to they want to they want to bounce, they want to get the girl out of there. Well, what are you teaching guys about this? Well, logistics is the most important thing ever. It's more important than your opener. Um, I have this saying at the ABCs where beginners think what to say. The average think how to say it. The experts think where. Experts think where. Where do you take her physically and where do you take her emotionally? Okay. So I'll do this exercise with my students where we'll reverse engineer. We'll, we'll, we'll start backwards from, you know, she's in your bedroom and then working all the way back to the club and try to define every single step of the way and how you're going to lead her there. Um, so there's this one thing that I'll, I'll have. I call it my uh, extraction excuse or what I call like options. Okay. It's like football yeah. running, running options. So I'm talking to her and I've got my drink, right? And I'm talking to her and let's say, um, you know, in Toronto, uh, or Vancouver. And what, what do you have? That's pretty cool at your place, Tony. Like you would like, Hey, come on over and, and 
at my place, yeah, I might say, "Come try Little Big Planet." It's like a stupid little video game with some the girls. Seem to know this game. Really, really Little Big Planet. Planet. Okay. Yeah, I've never heard of like it, it, but cool, cool. Yeah, I've pulled girls with that <laughs> little big kind of game. Okay. If they don't know what it is, I sell them on it. Oh, it's this stupid game where you play with little dolls and shit. Okay, so a, let's say I'm I'm Tony in Vancouver, and I'm talking to you. Or and, wine. Yeah. I have wine. That works. Wine, too. <laughs> absolutely. And things are good. And so I, I, I might have a beer or whatever, and I'm talking to you. Things are really good. So I'm like, hey. Do you want to hear your options for having an incredible time tonight? Then it's saying yes. Yeah. So option one is we can go back to my place and open up this new bottle of wine that I just bought from Paris, and we can play this amazing game called Little Planet, where you play with dolls. It's incredible. Yeah. I'm sorry. That was oh, your that's only right. option. That's the only option. That was your only option for having a great night. So it's you upsell, and then you kind of make it a joke, and she giggles. I like that. No. I like how you upsell it. You're really painting like the bright picture, like mm. you said that this is this is awesome. Like when I tell girls that I'm trying to bring them home, I tell them we're going to the palace or the chateau, which is like a standard technique. But your delivery was great. A lot of guys they they seem to humble themselves too much when it comes to something like pulling. But you're really expressing that this is like a big deal. You're gonna come. You're gonna have this wine from Paris. <laughs> like uh, it's actually from the yeah yeah. Well, the thing is like well, let me tell you a quick aside. Um, one of my instructors, uh, he was retired now because he's married, and I had the great honor of presiding over and officiating his wedding. Um, what he did did in New York as he has his condo. And he would tell girls, including the woman he would eventually marry, um, and he would say, hey, I have this incredible nature view. It's an incredible nature view of New York. And, yeah. you know, when his future wife and every girl that he pulled to his place, what's the first thing that they do when they come to his condo? They go to the window and they open up the curtain to see this incredible nature view. So yeah. the future Mrs. Lee did that. She goes to the window, pulls open the curtain, and there's a tree. <laughs> There's a tree. <laughs> he didn't lie. <laughs> there is a nature view, right? Yeah. It's about just stacking the deck in your favor. You know, it's about increasing your probability because if a girl wants to sleep with you, she'll say yes regardless of what your excuse yeah. is. But it's like the girls in the maybe, like you want to stack the deck so that that maybe is converted to a yes. And what if your logistics are set so that you can't bring her home, you're in a different town, mm -hmm. or you, you just aren't close by, and you're thinking it's her place? Because I had a client kind of getting upset about this the other night, and he was saying to me, why can't I just say, hey, let's go to your house and hang out? And I'm saying, well, you can with some girls, but how? Would, what are your thoughts on that? Well, obviously, it's better if you're in control of your own logistics, but if you have to, you can go to her place. You, you could say something like, hey, your place or your place, right? Um, but it, so you find it, that's kind of direct, it might throw up some sort of resistance. Yeah, that's the thing about if you don't have a place, like you're, you're dealing with the consequences of not having your own logistics handled. So yep. you're making, you have to make the, the best of a bad situation. But here's what he can do. Um, that's what I teach. And because I, I travel a lot, I go to hotels, is get an app called Hotel Tonight. You know, you put your credit card in and basically it gives you like the top three like options in the city that you're in and you can just like a press of a button book a hotel i had one of my uh my guys he did this right and he's like oh you know we can go back to my place you know i'm just here in town and he like he doesn't have a place and he just books it on the spot with his app he just books it on the spot <laughs> when she says yeah. and, he, and, he, and he, he like goes in and he's like hey i, I think actually my 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 hotel card got demagnetized, so let me go to the front office and get it, and then I'll grab you. Gets a card and goes up to the hotel room, and she's like, where's all your baggage? It's like, airline lost it. It's lying face off. It's a, what, what, a, what a rogue, what a rogue that man is. Yeah, I, well, I you don't have a place, and you got to make the best of it, right? I think a lot of seduction, guys focus so much on the content of the words and, and all these fun tactics a little bit and stuff, when really it comes down to problem solving. It's like, how can we solve this problem? Do you have a, something blocking your path from getting you this girl to solve the problem? And a lot of guys seem to struggle with that. Yeah, I think 
guys that get into the community probably learned it's, a, it's called learned helplessness right yeah. um where they weren't necessarily taught those problem solving skills or they believe that you know like i believe that you either have it or you don't right you either are good looking and girls will come to you or you're gonna you're you're, you're hopeless um and so, trend. You can't just get it easy right <laughs> um and so you know again with some of my clients some of these guys they need a lot of hand holding, right? And I have to teach them. You know what? You gotta start learning how to swim in the deep end, right? I went to had a student in New York, and I was like trying to tell him in the debrief. Like I was telling him in the field, but he, he couldn't get it, right? But I was trying to tell him, okay, lean against the wall so you can isolate the girl. And he didn't get it. We were texting him and trying to whisper into his ear and all that kind of stuff. And later in debrief, he was like. But I couldn't lean against the wall. The wall was like 10 feet away. <laughs> it's like, we're not saying try to lean and if you if you miss the wall, you fall on the floor. We're like, how do you get to the wall? You walk over there. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, would love, I love just talk, talking about coaching techniques with other coaches because it's so educational for me to learn from other guys and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this has been a great interview. Is there anything you want to add to the end, maybe – Anywhere you want to direct the viewers to go other than your website, which I think is abcsofattraction.com. Yeah, yeah. abcsofattraction.com. You can email us at support at abcsofattraction.com. Um, we can call us toll-free, 1-888-689-GAME. Uh, it's 4263. Um, and I, I mean, call that when I'm really just to talk with you about, you know, like uh, my feelings and shit. <laughs> I know you now. <laughs> we do get like random guys that will call and they'll be like heartbroken and it's like hey we're here to, to help you out but we're not a free dating advice line oneitis.com yeah okay so um is there anything else you wanted to add for all my uh all my listeners a lot of them are asians and they're probably sure, stoked sure. to talk to a specialist yeah, I would say, guys, you know what? If I can do it, you can do it. Like, learn to be successful because you're an Asian man and not in spite of it. That you can date any woman regardless of race. And don't limit yourself to any one particular race. I'm not saying you have to marry, like, a white girl or an Asian girl. But if you imagine Asian girls, they don't limit themselves to dating just Asian guys. Like, here in America, like, 50, almost 50% 50 of Asian girls will marry a non-Asian. And here in the United States, like one out of four, one out of five, something like Asian guys will never get married. Uh, Asian girls aren't limiting themselves. So you as an Asian man should not limit yourself, right? You should have options just like women do. And you need to learn and be successful because you're a successful Asian man and not in spite of it. Absolutely. Thanks for, uh, thanks, thanks for coming on the show. And, and Thanks for having me, Tony. And that was J.T. Tran of ABCs of Attraction, a really interesting guy from Hollywood, California. You should check out his, his blog at ABCs of Attraction and subscribe to my channel while you're at it. Then you can go to my website at absoluteability.com for more content, interviews, and stuff that will change your life. Until next time.